This morning, Amen. leaning on the everlasting arms, and we can always lean on Jesus, and He will always be there for us. Amen. Amen. Y'all excited about the Lord's Day today? Amen. All right, some of you were cheering Friday night, right? As Riverdale won their football game, so let's give them a round of applause today. <laughs> some of you maybe were cheering yesterday, but we want to make sure on the Lord's Day. That we worship the Lord in spirit and truth. So let's go to him in prayer right now. Lord Jesus, we love you so much. It's a privilege to be in this place of worship. We ask that our worship would be pleasing to you. We thank you for working in our lives and just allowing us to be able to experience your glory. Jesus, we know that we're unworthy of all the blessings that you give to us. But we are truly grateful for the blessings that you've placed in our lives and help us to always just to give you the glory and the honor for it. We want the Holy Spirit to have complete control over this service today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated here. Now, just a reminder for you, if you don't remember this, but every time this year we have a Georgia, Bernard, Georgia Barnett emphasis, and so this is the week of prayer, and so we have a, a place for you to pick up a pamphlet as you're leaving today to be in prayer for our state. Now probably more so than ever as we look across our state there are needs and so we want to make sure that we're doing our best to meet those needs and so next Sunday we'll take up a love offering for Georgia Barnett as we try to meet our goal. Now let me ask you this, how many of you know what's going on Tuesday night? Tuesday night here. Most of you do, it's going to be a great time, we're going to have some football teams here as we have Mark Pittman here coming and sharing a powerful testimony. Now let me just say this to you. This is an opportunity that we have to be able to minister to people in our community. I couldn't think of any individual, a member here at First Baptist Church, not inviting someone to be at that event, much less not being at the event when we're trying to let people hear the gospel of Jesus Christ and their lives be transformed because of who Jesus is. Amen? All right, let's sing to the Lord. Continue to sing, Blessed Assurance. Blessed Assurance.
to stand as we sing, fill my life.
Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for another day. We thank you for all our many blessings, Lord, that we know that we don't deserve, Lord. And this morning we just lift your name up, Lord. And uh, I just ask that you place your hand on Brother Nathan, Lord, as he brings your message, Lord. And may we receive it with enthusiasm, Lord, and use it, make it speak into our lives, Lord. And if there's anyone here, Lord, that doesn't know you, may they, may they accept you, Lord, as their personal Lord and Savior. And all these things, forgive us for where we fail you. We ask in your holy name. Amen. <laughs> Every time I try to make it on my own Every time I try to stand I start to
Well, in Texas, it's not bragging if it's true. Didn't they did do a great job this morning? Let's give them another round of applause. Well, we are blessed to be here, and we know that Jesus is here with us today. And so I'm watching all of you. I want you to keep that in mind today as we listen to what the Lord has in store for us because families are the bedrock to any society. As go the family, goes the nation, the communities, the churches. We have been told over the years that there's no instruction manual for children. But let me tell you, there is an instruction manual for children. It's called the Bible. There's an instruction manual for our families because marriage is the supreme commitment in any relationship in life. And I hope that you understand today that marriage is sacred. We honor it, and it is holy in the sight of God. Now, this morning, we're going to be looking at some kingdom principles. And notice I said kingdom principles because we have different roles and different functions As a husband and wife. So take your Bibles today and find Colossians chapter 3. If you haven't already. And listen to these verses very carefully. And how about you stand in honor and reverence of God's word this morning. Colossians chapter 3 verse 18. Oh listen to this verse very carefully. Wives submit to your own husbands. As is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be bitter toward them. Children, obey your parents in all things. For this is well pleasing to the Lord. Fathers, do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your precious and holy word. It is not suggestions to live by, but it is commandments and principles that we must adhere to in our lives. We ask that the Holy Spirit would teach us today the things that we need to know about who you are and what you expect of us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now this morning, we have four responsibilities that honor the Lord. And I want you to listen to this very carefully. It honors the Lord. And when we accept these responsibilities, as we accept these responsibilities as a family, we know that our family can honor the Lord. Now, first of all, I want us to see this responsibility, a wife's responsibility. A wife's responsibility. How many of you realize that our attitude matters to God? Our attitude matters. And so if you have a bad attitude, I want you to get your attitude in line with the Holy Scriptures of God because our attitude matters. How is your attitude this morning as you came into this place to worship the Lord? Now I want you to notice, this is the words from Almighty God. Not the words of Nathan Davis, not the words of preachers, but the words of Almighty God. It says a wife's responsibility is that she is supposed to submit to her husband. Now, what does that mean, to submit? Because our society today has said that is a negative word, that's not a positive word. Our society has been influenced by feminism and materialism and says that book that we have called the Bible, it's archaic, it is out of date, and we no longer have to abide by those principles. But let me tell you this, the word submit means to express voluntary and positive submission. Now, men, you can't go up to your wife and say, woman, submit. Can't do that. You know why? You want her to do that out of love and admiration for who you are, to do it voluntarily because it is positive. Now, I want us to think about this. And I want you women to think about this, those of you that are wives. How does this make you feel right now? Oh, I've been preaching this and teaching this long enough that I know what some of you are thinking already. You say, I don't have to do that. I don't have to do that. Maybe some of you are saying, I will not do that. 
And then some of you may be thinking, who says I have to do that? But I know some of you very well. You say, I will gladly do that if that's what the Bible says. The Apostle Paul says you submit because it is fitting to the Lord. It is fitting to the Lord. Now, a husband cannot ask his wife to do anything outside of the will of God. Now, let me just make this very clear. If it's outside of the will of God, he cannot ask her to do that. Because in order for her to be able to do that, she would be sinning against God. She would be sinning against her relationship with her husband. Now, why do we do this? Because who does it please? It pleases the Lord. Peter had something to say about this. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3. Verse 1 says this. Wives, likewise, be submissive to your own husbands, that even if some do not obey the word, they without a word may be won by the conduct of their wives. When they observe your chaste and conduct accompanied by fear. And then verses 6 and 7, look at this. As Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters you are if you do good and not afraid with any terror. Husbands, likewise, dwell with them with understanding, giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel, and being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers may not be hindered. The Bible makes it very clear when there is submissiveness, it honors the Lord. And even without speaking words, a lady's action can allow the husband to realize something's going on in my wife's life. Something is different about her. Maybe your husband doesn't know the Lord, as Peter would say, and by your conduct, by your actions, you're revealing that there's something unique about you. You're honoring the Lord by your submissiveness to him. Titus chapter 2 verse 4 says that the older women are supposed to teach the younger women how to love their husbands and to honor their children. Let me tell you this. If the older generation does not teach the younger generation how to honor and respect husbands, who will? The older women have that responsibility. Now, I want you to just look around today at the older women. Now, don't look too carefully because you may offend somebody if you think that they're old, right? So be careful. Who are the older women? Those that are a little bit older than most of us that are here today. Right? So the older women teach the younger women how they're supposed to conduct themselves, how they're supposed to live. And I'll show you this. I'll tell you this. Just if you observe and watch, if they do not teach the younger women, then you'll see a generation that thinks that they can dishonor and disrespect husbands. You turn on the television set today, you watch a show that is supposed to be funny, and at times they are funny, but you will see that they disrespect husbands. They look at them as being ignorant, not knowing anything, and foolish. And so a generation thinks that with a father, with someone that is responsible, that they don't have to be respected. But Peter said that Sarah spoke to Abraham with respect. Now, listen to this carefully. A wife can disagree with her husband, but it has to be with respect. You may not see eye to eye on what he's asking you to do, but you do so with respect. And then you work together as a team in order to be able to accomplish what the Lord wants you to accomplish in your life. This is a wife's responsibility. Secondly, we see here the husband's responsibility. Husbands, love your wives and do not be bitter toward them. You say, well, I'm so glad you got to the husbands. It's all their fault. If they would only do what they're supposed to do, then I would willfully submit to my husband. The husband's responsibility is our leadership matters to God. Men, I want you to listen to me very carefully. Our leadership matters to God. He is the head of the home, 
just like Christ is the head of the church. Men, you have that responsibility. You're the head of your home. Now, you may not want that responsibility, just like Adam didn't want the responsibility in the Garden of Eden when he should have been the spiritual leader and told Eve, no, we're not going to do that. This is sinning against God, and there will be consequences for many years to come. She ate of the fruit, and then she gave it to the man. He did not take spiritual responsibility. And today, I believe every woman is born with a sinful nature of Eve. She wants to usurp the authority of man and God. Every man is born with a sinful nature of Adam in that he wants to let the woman take the responsibility. But you cannot do that. In fact, the Bible tells us that in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3. And we need to make Jesus the head of our homes. Jesus has to be the head of our home. In order for our home to function as it should be, Jesus has to be the head of the home. Now, in order for a church to function as it should be, Jesus is the head of the church. And so we honor Jesus. We, we respect him. We worship him. And the man is responsible for the home. He cannot say someone else is responsible. He cannot blame his wife. He cannot blame his children. He has to take that responsibility as the spiritual leader of the home. He can never get rid of it. He can't give it away. He can't say, it's not my responsibility. It's his responsibility. And so the Bible says, he loves his wife. The word love there is one that you're very familiar with. It's the word agape. It's an unconditional, selfless love. And husbands, if you love your wives that way unconditionally, then you're loving them the way that Christ loves them. Now, I'll tell you, most people love conditionally today. If something doesn't go the way that they want it to go, they say, well, I no longer love you. But love is more than an emotion. It's a commitment. Marriage is a commitment for an entire lifetime. And when we make our vows to God, we say things like this. Until death do us part. Until death do us part. We say that we will honor each other, we will cherish each other. As I saw yesterday afternoon of a young couple making that commitment to each other. And the pastor made everyone that was witnesses there that day, yesterday, to know that they are responsible for making sure that that couple keeps their commitment to God and to each other. We don't make excuses. We don't say things are going to get better. It doesn't bother anyone. In fact, I want you to do this. Sometimes they'll say, well, the children are going to be better off. Research has concluded time and time again that the children, if you were to ask them, they would say, no, they didn't want their mom and dad to get a divorce. It's caused more hardships in their life. It's made life more difficult. And so God wants us to honor that relationship. And men, let me tell you this. Earl Wilson said, An exhaustive study shows that no woman has ever shot her husband while he was doing the dishes. Some of you will get that when you're going home today. You say, well, I never do the dishes. Well, if you want to do the dishes, just rest assured that if your wife ever gets so upset with you, she's not going to shoot you. But we have to do our part. We have to make sure that we are taking care of things as they should be. A wife may say, if he loves me this way, I will gladly submit to him. But women, have you ever thought that your husband may love you because of the way that you submit to him? He sees how you honor the Lord. He sees how you respect the Lord. And women, we have the responsibility, you have the responsibility of showing respect to him. You want to crush him, you disrespect him in front of other people. You go and talk about him privately with your girlfriends and word will get back to him and you think it never will get back to him. Oh yes, he'll hear about it. And if he finds out you disrespected him, it will bother him 
And I want you to think about it from this perspective. You say, well, well, he's changed. When I married him, he was Fabio. But now he's flabby and bulging. He's no longer the man that he used to be. Men, you may have married a woman who was beautiful, but now she has a Supreme Court figure. No appeal. <laughs> Things change in life. We have to love those people just the way that they are, even though they change. Because we've made a lifetime commitment. Now, the Bible says he loves his wife the way that Christ loves the church. How much does Christ love the church? He gave his life for the church. And husbands, don't ever become bitter towards your wife. What causes bitterness? Usually hurt feelings. You say, well, he doesn't get his feelings hurt. Oh, yes, just watch him. Maybe watch her husband if her feelings are hurt. Usually communication, it changes. You hurt someone's feelings, and if they're not careful, as the Bible says in Ephesians 4, 31 and Hebrews 12, 15, it becomes a root. It becomes a root of bitterness. And communication is lacking. They say that money is the number one cause of divorce, but I have observed in counseling people, usually communication is right up there on the list because they're not communicating. They're not talking. Somebody got their feelings hurt, and so now they're going to take it out on them. They're going to let people know what they really think about them. No, we honor our spouses. We forgive. As Peter would say, if your home is broken, ask God for forgiveness. And let me make this very clear before we move on. Satan wants to destroy our homes. Wants to destroy them. And if he can destroy the home, he can impact the nation. He can impact where we're headed as a nation because he starts with a home. And let me just make this very clear. We have to defend our homes. We have to stand up and be men. Now, the fix isn't to get a new spouse. The fix is to fulfill kingdom responsibilities. Let me tell you what happens. And someone says, well, I'll find somebody else and I'll be better off. The truth is they're not better off in most cases. Because if they haven't learned the lessons that they needed to learn and learn from their mistakes, they just repeat them. And so you may be saying, well, what do I do? I've, I've already done that. I've already moved forward in life. Well, let me tell you this. Divorce is not the unpardonable sin. There's forgiveness. There's grace. There's mercy. But we never excuse it and say that there's nothing wrong with it because it violates God's word. It violates his plan for the home and for the church. And so we do ask God to forgive us and we move on. And you probably heard me say this before. You can't unscramble eggs. But you got to move forward. Ask the Lord to forgive you. Ask him to make this relationship stronger as we honor the Lord. And then I want us to see here thirdly, a child's responsibility. Our obedience matters to God. Listen to this. Children, obey your parents in all things. Now, let me ask you this. Do you think the Bible literally means all things? All things. And then listen, for this is well-pleasing to the Lord. Children have the responsibility of being obedient to their parents. Now, ladies, before we go too far with this, let me remind you, in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 24, it says, Wives, be obedient to their husbands in everything. Everything that honors God. So if we want our children to honor us and to obey us, we have to show our children that we're doing the same in our relationships. Now, you probably are aware of this, but in some marriage vows today, some of them say, well, I'm not going to say the word obey. But let me tell you this. If God says that's what we're supposed to do, then we have to do it. If we want his blessings on our life. The Bible says when children 
honor their parents, it's well-pleasing to the Lord. Now, why are our children doing the, some of the things that we see them doing on the streets today? I'll tell you this. It started with a family not making Christ the head of their home, not doing the things that would be advantageous to their, their home and to their family so that they know what's right and what's wrong. Most children today in some settings, they don't know what's right and wrong. Sin has become common practice in their home. And maybe they didn't have the privilege and opportunity that we've had to have godly parents that respected the Lord and lived for the Lord. And so we have to teach the children why they have to do those things. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 3, listen to this. It says, it's a commandment, a promise. If you want to live long here on this earth, you honor your parents. You obey them. You listen to them. Now, let me tell you this, those of you that are a little bit younger. Right now, you think that your parents don't know a whole lot of anything. Maybe that's what you're taught. But the older you get, the more you realize your parents knew a whole lot more than what you thought they knew. With your maturity, with your understanding in life, you realize, hey, they really do want what's best for me. And I'll just tell you this, having worked with children and youth and college students, I can show you a family that is not honoring the Lord and living for the Lord, and they think they don't have to respect the laws of the land. They think that they don't have to respect those in spiritual leadership. They can do whatever they want to do with no consequences to it. Where did they learn those things? They learned it from mom and dad in the home in most cases. Not all cases, but in most cases. You have a young adult that is disrespectful to those in leadership. I can show you a parent that in most cases will be disrespectful to leadership in their own life. They don't want to follow rules. They want to do their own thing. And the children see that. And so that's how they live their lives. But it's a commandment of promise. You want to live long? The Bible says that you honor your parents. Obey them. Now let me tell you this. Parents, if you say you obey me because I'm the parents and you don't explain to them why they should be obeying you, then you have failed to educate. You have failed to teach them what they need to know. And as it comes to our own lives, we have to make sure that our children, the next generation, knows how to honor God and live for God. And that's the child's responsibility. Fourthly, a father's responsibility. The Bible says, fathers, do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. We treat our children with respect. You say, well, they're children. They don't deserve our respect. Yes, they do. You know, in the, in the Bible days, they, they looked at women and children really as second-class citizens. So when Jesus was here on this earth in his earthly ministry, he made sure that he was ministering to the women. He was ministering to the children. He said, don't forbid the children from coming to me. And He was showing them how to love them and how to respect them. Fathers, it's our primary responsibility to train our children. Now, if you're not doing it and you have relegated your responsibility to the church, make sure you have them at church if you're not going to fulfill your responsibility. And the church will be there as a substitute, but they are not the primary responsibility. You have to do that. And as you do that, it honors the Lord. Now, let me ask you this. Fathers, do you enjoy training your children how to fish? You say, oh, yes, I have memories of the first fish that they caught. Do you enjoy training them how to hunt? You say, oh, yes, I remember the first buck or first doe that they killed. Fathers, do you enjoy training them how to play sports? You say, oh, yes, I remember when they scored their first touchdown. I remember when they made their first basket. But can you remember training them how to be evangelists for Jesus Christ and leading people to Jesus and saying, I remember the first time they led someone to Jesus Christ. That's our responsibility, to teach them to be like Jesus. 
And when they do something great for the kingdom of God, we need to encourage them and support them and say, hey, you got it figured out. But so many fathers focus on the things of the world today and will encourage their children doing the things of the world instead of doing the things of God. Now, I'll tell you this, and you can write it down. I want my children to be successful in life. I want them to to grow in Christ. And I want them to be effective in living here on this earth. But most importantly, I want them to honor Jesus Christ with their life. Because if they have succeeded in all these worldly things, yet they have not succeeded in living for Jesus Christ, they would be a failure. Now, I know for many of you that's a hard pill to swallow because you weren't taught that. That wasn't emphasized in your home, and so you encourage them with doing worldly things instead of doing spiritual things. And so listen to this. We train them. We teach them. Train them. Teach them. Now, in the Davis household, at at nighttime, when the kids are going to bed, we read them the Bible. We read them stories. We take turns. When I'm talking to them, I'm explaining Scripture to them. I'm explaining the Proverbs to them. I'm explaining what the Bible means and how they can apply it to their life. You know they will not be perfect children. No preacher's kids ever are. No deacon's kids ever are. None of your kids ever are. But we are teaching them to live for Jesus Christ. If I were to go to your child today and said, how about you tell me the books of the Bible? They should have learned that as a a little kid, the books of the Bible. They should be able to know the Ten Commandments by heart. They should know what the Bible says. The Ten Commandments should be posted for us to look at them so that we can honor them. You see, we have that responsibility. We are to pastor our homes, men. Pastor our homes. We provide for our children. We teach them the things of God, but we pastor our homes. And so we refer and we respect parental authority. Have you taught your children to respect authority? If you teach them to respect you, they will respect others. If you allow them to disrespect you, they will disrespect others. And so you have to teach them how to honor authority in their own life. I can show you someone that didn't discipline their children in home, that didn't give punitive damage or discipline in their life, and they think they can do whatever they want to do. Why? Because mom and dad allow them to get away with it at home, and so oftentimes, if they're not careful, they'll get into a lot of trouble with the law and a lot of trouble with the Lord because they think they can do whatever they want to do. And so listen to this carefully. We are forming character, spiritual, intellectual, emotional, and physical nourishment. And the Bible says here we don't provoke them, we don't discourage them. When you look at the children, do you see good attitudes in your children? Do you see good attitudes or do you see bad attitudes? When you tell them to come to church, do they have a good attitude about coming to church or do they have a negative attitude? I'll tell you, if mom and dad are excited about coming to church, in all likelihood, the kids will get excited about coming to church. If mom and dad get up at 4 o'clock in the morning to go on a hunting trip, or they will drive hours and hours to go to a ball game, and they're excited, and they're prepared, the children see that, and they know if mom and dad had the same enthusiasm for worshiping the Lord like they do the things of the world. They know. And so we defend our families. And the church is no stronger than our families. In order for First Baptist Church to be a strong church, we have to have strong families. And I'll tell you this. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, my family tries to honor the Lord and show you how we can all honor the Lord. 
We want to make sure that our life is pleasing to the Lord. Our relationships are pleasing to Him. Now the nation is no stronger than our families. You want to see a nation that's headed to destruction? You see a nation that doesn't honor God and live for God. Turn real quickly to Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 12. Yesterday, I was glad to see this verse be a part of a wedding ceremony. Friday, in our church, we have a, a young baby boy that will be with us before too long. And as we reflect upon all these things in our lives, we know this. Ecclesiastes 4.12 Though one may be overpowered by another, two can withstand him, and a threefold cord is not quickly broken. You want to have a strong marriage? You want to have a strong home? Make Jesus the head of the home. Make Jesus the head of the church. When I'm counseling young couples before they get ready to say, I do, and I tell them when they say, I do, that's not just for a little while, that's forever. That's as long as you both shall live. And I tell that couple, it's like a triangle. The man, the woman, the closer you get to God, watch this, the closer you get to God, the closer you get to each other. The farther away you get from God, in all likelihood, the farther away you get from each other. Don't you know that God is the one that invented the family? It's the first institution. Adam and Eve in the garden. God said it's not good for a man to be alone. But he provided a helper, a helpmate for him. And as they were together and as they experienced life together, they had some difficulties. There was consequences for their sin. But through it all, God wants our families to be strong. He wants our families to be honoring to Him. You know why? Because He designed it. He's the architect. He's the one that made it. And so in order for us to be able to do that, we must honor Jesus. Today, dear friends, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, before it's eternally too late, Surrender your life to Jesus. Make him the Lord and Savior of your life. And if he's not the Lord of your life, in all likelihood, there's no way that he could be the Lord of your home. So maybe today you need to repent and say, Jesus, I want you to be the Lord of my home. I want you to be the Lord of my family. I want you to be the Lord of my life. Because let me tell you, life is full of hardships. It's full of difficulties. And so we have to lean on Jesus. We have to trust in him. Lord Jesus, we love you. We thank you for the privilege to serve you. We thank you that we have an instruction manual to know what you expect of our families, what you expect of our homes. And Lord Jesus, we know that life is messy. We oftentimes do things that we shouldn't do. But Lord, help us to repent. Help us to trust in you. Help us to surrender our families to you. And Lord, if there's a need for reconciliation, oh Lord, I've seen it. I know how you can work. Reconcile those differences. Reconcile those families. And you'll get the glory and the honor for it. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I want you to stand now. I want you to stand so that we can do business with the Lord today. And I'll tell you this. If you believe families are worth praying for, that families are worth fighting for, then that means we have to take action. We have to take decisive action. That means we don't stand still and let somebody else do it. We do our part. So as Melanie plays, you come and do business with the Lord.
And we'll make sure that our relationships honor him today. As she plays, you come. Melanie continues to play, let me just encourage you this way. You say, we're preacher, I think everything's good right now. I think everything's good. My friend, when you start to drift, when you start to think everything is good, and there's no need to act, you're susceptible to the enemy's attacks. So make your family stronger than it's ever been before. She's going to continue to play. You come and do business with the Lord. be seated thank you so much for your kind attention today I know what some of you are thinking you said well I wish so and so would have been here today to hear this message let me tell you this the message was for all of us that were here today you can encourage people to go online to listen to the message you can pass on the word but the message is for all of us here today and we want to make sure that our families honor the Lord. I hope that you know that I love you with all my heart. And I want what's best for our church. And I want your life to be pleasing to the Lord. And I want my life to be pleasing to the Lord. And so we love each other. We help each other along the way. Don't forget tonight at 6 o'clock our evening worship service. And then Tuesday night will be our meeting here. Will, you have any final words for people and getting ready for Tuesday night? All right. It's going to be a great night. We're going to have a powerful testimony. If you haven't got your tickets, get your tickets. And most importantly, invite someone to come and put a ticket in someone's hand so that they can hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. Also, Wednesday night, our evening service. And then, uh, not this Wednesday night, but the following Wednesday night, we will have at least two churches that will join us as I talk about the qualifications, role, and responsibility for deacons. If you weren't with us Wednesday night, we talked about how we we're getting ready to call some deacons here at First Baptist Church. So we're going to talk about what those qualifications are, role and responsibility. And then at the end of this month, Lord willing, we're going to have a revival. And it's going to be a great revival. We will have godly men coming from all over the place to be here with us at First Baptist Church. And you see a list of names there in your bulletin, the flyer that we have. Anything else before we dismiss today? Anything else? All right. Um, if you haven't seen it on Facebook yet, um, Chris and Carenza had their baby boy on Friday, uh, Keegan Christopher, and they are home doing fine. Yes, very good. It's going to be exciting. Chris told me the other day, he said, Brother Nathan, I can't wait for you to just be able to hold him. I said, I can't wait to. That's going to be exciting. A young man one day growing and living for the Lord.
Lord Jesus Christ. Nothing like it. For those of you that have watched us today, thank you for being a part of our service. Will Allman 